Well, Merry Christmas, everyone. It's a, it's a blessing to have you all here today. How many of you were here last night? This is a rerun for you. <laughs> we're going to talk about the real meaning of Christmas. Um, yesterday, I, I talked about um, the prophet John says, and so this is Christmas, and what have you done? Another year older, a new one's just begun. It's a... John Lennon, if you guys don't know who John is. Different crowd here today. (laughs) Christmas is one of those things where we get very distracted. If you're like me, it's easy to become engulfed in what society and this world and this culture tells us Christians should practice as, and uh, and the rest of the world as well. In fact, I know some... uh, Jewish folks who celebrate Christmas because they like all the things that go with it. The, you know, incessant shopping, the running up of debt, all of that. (laughs) Christmas is one of those things where if you're not careful, you can become completely lost in the holiday season and you miss the holy day, which it's supposed to be. And of course, everyone knows it's about Santa. And in whatever movie it is that you watch, in fact, children know much more about Santa than I think they do about Jesus, at least in our culture. I'm certainly not saying your children, but uh, in our culture, they know more about Santa and a sleigh and Rudolph and they sing songs and we're just inundated with all of these secular things, the fable of uh, what Santa Claus really is instead of who Christ really is. And we can get inundated with that. And when you have kids, you, you know, we went through that. Do you, do you tell the kids about Santa? And if you do, then you risk being found a liar later. And then they say, well, what about Jesus? Is, is he real too? And so we had, to, we had to take that to our kids very young in life. And it was real interesting because there were folks that thought we were like demonic or something because we told our kids the truth about the person who Santa was, who St. Nicholas was, and how he bought gifts and, and, and what a great man of God he was. And yet, that's not the, the person that the rest of the world understands. You know, he knows when you've been sleeping, he knows when you're awake, he knows if you've been bad or good, so you better be good for goodness sake. It's kind of a tool to use on your kids to make them behave. Um, but the fact of the matter is, Jesus sees you when you're sleeping, he knows when you're awake. And it's interesting how they've deified this character Um, And it's difficult to be a Christian in a culture that's so inundated with Santa. And of course, we always think Santa should be with snow and reindeer and sleds, but not all over the world is it like that. Uh, Sometimes they celebrate, you know, in skin-tight swimsuits, and uh, that's, that's Santa in warm weather. Of course, it could be about the decorating, could be about all of the decorations, you know, throughout the house and the bows and the wrapping paper. And, you know, you can get swelled up in that. And, you know, well, it's just a little bit more and just click this for Amazon. It'll come to your door and you won't have to worry about it. And so we get into all of the decorating. Some people get really into decorating, like with lights. And, of course, uh, the, the, the fable is if you don't have lights in your house, Santa can't find your house. For the guy that knows when you've been sleeping, knows when you're awake, knows if you've been bad or good. He can't find your house if you don't have lights on. Um, So people go way over the top with decorating the outside of their house with lights, with blow-up things of every sort and kind. And it doesn't even matter if it's related to Christmas almost as long as, you know, well, I paid a lot of money for this. I'm blowing it up and putting it on my lawn. And we get caught up into this whole festivity, you know, keeping up with the Joneses and, and all of that mess. And we call it Christmas. Of course, you have to have matching pajamas. <laughs> Didn't you know? It's about family. It's about getting together with family and having, you know, people and everybody has that uncle. You know, it's just getting together with family and it can be uncomfortable, it can be difficult, or it can be a riot. Uh, we used to have a famous Nerf war at Christmas time, our family. Um, I haven't gotten on board with the PJs yet, but food. Nobody's going to confess. It's about the food. Christmas is about the food. It's about the wonderful things that people make and, for Carol's case, brings to our house and feeds us with. 
I'm just grateful for the food. It's wonderful. And we can become very sidetracked by about all the preparations and getting it ready and making just the perfect bread or baked good or, you know, is it a ham? Is it a turkey? What are we having? Are we, you know, can we have steak? Could you grill outside? I bet you could, even in the winter. Or maybe it's about the Christmas movies, you know, whether you're going to watch Elf or uh, Miracle on 34th Street or It's a Wonderful Life, one of my favorites, or you're going to watch one of the other ones. Um, it, it's, it's these movies and it's nostalgia and it's remembering when you were a child and, you know, you know you're going to, you know, shoot your eye out, you know, that, all that, all that stuff. And we get sidetracked with the movies and the entertainment. And, and of course, if you have kids, especially, it's about gifts. It's about the gifts and watching the kids tear them open and they could hardly recognize what they have. They go, wow, and they need another one. And then they go, wow, and then they get another one. And pretty soon the house is just completely wrecked and they have to go back and remember what it is they got because they were moving so quickly. We didn't do that in my house. We made each kid open one at a time and everybody watched. And then it was somebody else's turn. And you had to choose somebody to go to the pile and you go to the pile. So if you got a big pile, you take turns. And taught them to savor it and appreciate it. And it goes longer, which is better. And you can kind of clean up the mess as you go anyway. <laughs> the historical real meaning of Christmas is not about Saturnalia. <laughs> it's not about all of the other things that you might know about historically. And if you know, if you know about all those things, you're probably the smartest person in the room. It's about the prophecies about how God would send his only son to the world to save the world by dying for it, which if you're a fan of superheroes, that's a bizarre way to fix things. But because God is just and God is loving, the only thing he could do was come down into a human body, live a perfect life, teach and point us to what's right, and then he bled and died in our stead. That is what Christmas is about, is remembering the Messiah, the Christ who came. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Jesus, God with us. And if he wasn't God, why would you call him that? The scripture calls him God with us, Emmanuel. That's what Christmas is about. Isaiah 9, 6, long before Jesus ever showed up, for unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I want you to note that every one of those titles is for Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting Father. He is the Prince of Peace. He is all of that. And it's all referring to Christ. So if he wasn't God, the scriptures wouldn't say that. And he came as a gift from God in the most helpless, humble way as a child. <coughs> You couldn't ask for a more humble entrance into the world. In Matthew 4, 16, it says, The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. This is a prophecy that he would be born in the area of Galilee, in Bethlehem, and a light has come. And the people who were in darkness, these 400 years that I alluded to, between Malachi and Matthew, a light has come that Jesus would come and he would be born in Bethlehem. And we know the story of how he came to the shepherds at night. In fact, we just sang about that. And the wise men end up coming later, by the way. It, he's about a year and a half old or so. He's just under two years old. And it's at another place and it's at another time and there's another description given of Jesus that he was a young child. He wasn't an infant. And so, you know, I know we have, uh, you know, all of the, the wise men and the shepherds all gathered around, but they weren't there at the same time, probably didn't know each other. But we know that it's part of the story. Reading from Matthew's account in chapter 2, now we know 
from Matthew chapter 1, uh, Luke chapter 1 rather, that he went and he interviewed. You know, he's, give me the facts, ma'am, just the facts. And he took down all the information. And so he gets this from Mary. He gets this from Mary as she gave birth to Jesus. She would know about it. So he's got this, he's the only Gentile writer of the Gospels who tells us from a third person's point of view as an interviewer what happened. It begins by here in verse 1. It came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. And so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. You see, Octavius, who took on the name Augustus, because it means like God. If you have to pick a nickname for yourself, that's a pretty bizarre one, isn't it? You could call me like God. Totally, like God. And so Octavius took on this name, and it's interesting because this bit of information is very specific and locks the birth of Jesus into a certain time. Very important that we have this. You know, as you read through the scriptures, you read through all these names and places, and all of that is hugely important for history so that we can locate and verify that everything in this book is true, and it is. So here's Octavius. Here's a picture of him, by the way. And he was collecting taxes. Uh, notice where New Jersey falls. Number two in the United States for taxes, um, just in case you were wondering. So those people who left, they're not so stupid. People that stay, like me. I'm here until the Lord takes me out. Anyway, he's gathering taxes, and what they had to do is go back to their hometown and register because that's where the public records were, and they were all written down before computers. So you've got to go back. And so as they do that, they're collecting taxes and these numbering people, there's a census. They want to know how many people, what their names are, how many kids they have, what their names are, so they can tax them. It's why people knock on your door and they say, hey, I understand you have a recent home improvement. Yes. Who are you? I'm from the assessor's office. <laughs> they don't care what it looks like. They're not looking to enjoy the fruits of your labor. They want to tax you more. Welcome to New Jersey. By the way, doesn't he look like this guy? They got the same smiles, you know, same shape, same cheekbones and everything. I just thought it was rather interesting. Anyway, moving on. Verse 4. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. Now, we read through that as the Christmas story, but we have a very Jewish man and a very Jewish woman. He's pledged to be married to her. It's a contract. She's found to be pregnant. She's 15 years old. Can you imagine your 15-year-old coming home pregnant and saying, it was the Holy Spirit? You know, Joseph is not going to have this. And Joseph stays with her. An angel has to come to him and tell him to stay. And so he does. And he stays with this 15-year-old betrothed, engaged wife who's pregnant with child. That's got to be a tough life. I've, I've known some people to have children that aren't their own and raise them, and that can be a very difficult transition. Imagine this. So he takes her on an 80-mile journey from Galilee, from Nazareth, up to Bethlehem, where he's from, from the lineage of David, so that they can verify who he is and then tax him appropriately. And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. You see, Jesus was born in a stall. Actually, it was probably an outcropping off of the road in the open air with animal feces on the ground. It wasn't a cute little crush, you know, with a thatched roof and some lights in it 
and hay everywhere and animals bowing before Jesus. This was the most unsanitary hospital you could pick. And of course it has to happen while they're on this journey in her third trimester. You know, just when you think you have one of those days where everything's going wrong, I can imagine under Joseph's breath saying, yeah, of course we gotta be taxed now in your third trimester. And of course you've gotta go into labor right here. And it's interesting because it says that she brought forth her firstborn son. There was no nurse, there was no helper. And I have a feeling Joseph didn't have the stomach for it. And so here's this young 15-year-old woman giving birth to the Son of God on her own. There was no room for them in the inn. The, this, is a, this isn't the Holiday Inn. This isn't the Red Roof Inn. This is an inn which was by any standards, not any stars on, on your uh, travel advisor. And that's where this all happened and where God sent the greatest gift to the world and laid him in a stone feeding trough. You know, we usually see this X and, you know, he's in hay and all that. It's a stone feeding trough. That's what a manger is. A crush is what became popular from, uh, uh, anyway, the history. This is what he, he was laid in, not that. And as much as we'd like to think that God came in a nice, comfortable setting, he came to an unwed mother, to a man who he wasn't related to, who raised him in a place where nobody would let them into their home. Remember, he went back to Bethlehem because he was of the, the lineage of David. So he's got people there. He's got friends. He's got family. None of them let him in because his bride-to-be was pregnant. Nobody wanted anything to do with them. In fact, they ran the risk of being stoned. This is how Jesus chose to come into the world. And Micah 5, 2 predicts that Bethlehem would be the place. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathath, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be the ruler of Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. You see, Jesus pre-existed his birth. In the form of God, he didn't think it robbery to be, to be equal with God, but he humbled himself and being found in the form of a man, he became a servant and he died even unto death on the cross. And that's why God raised him up. God came and dwelt among us and he pre-existed his birth, which I think is amazing. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were greatly afraid. Now you have to put yourself in their shoes. They're in the middle of a field with a bunch of sheep. Nobody around. Shepherds were not people you hung around with. They were very well-known thieves and they were also very dirty. It took them a month to get clean before they could go into the temple area. They had to go through this whole ceremony. They're all by themselves. There are no street lights. There are no helicopters. There are no lights in the sky other than the stars that they see. And suddenly, a giant spotlight from the sky is shining on them. They, they don't know what a spotlight is. They're like, oh, this is different. I mean, if a helicopter showed up at night over your head and shined a, a spotlight on you, you know, you'd, you'd go like this, right? A, if this happened to me, I'd be like, okay, what did I do? What, what did you find out I did? And so you know they're shaken up in the middle of the dark. Some very famous Abel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Rachel, Moses, David, Job, and Amos were all shepherds. It's rather interesting. And this is the house of David, right? Bethlehem, the town of David, who's a shepherd, king who was a predecessor and a shadow of Christ himself coming. And then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be for all the people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. 
So the angel shows up and says what all angels say. Don't be afraid. I imagine if you were to see an angel, you would be afraid. They're not little chubby children with little bows and arrows. They're, these, these are angels which would shake you up if you saw them. When I think about the Nephilim in chapter 6 of Genesis and what happens when you get a hybrid and how these were mighty men of old, and I think about that, and I think, my goodness, these guys must be scary to see because everyone is afraid when they see them. And so they say, you go to Bethlehem because this day is born to you a Savior. It's a baby. I want you to go see the baby. And it's interesting, no one else knows about this except the shepherds. Why would, why would God tell the shepherds about the birth of his son? Let me ask you another question. Why would he tell you? I feel much less important <laughs> knowing that God spoke to my heart and revealed to me who Christ is. He did it for the shepherds so he could do it for me. And so Jesus is wrapped in swaddling clothes. They still do this with babies today. They, they take a baby that's born and they clean them all off and weigh them and, you know, cause a little pain on their foot and they get an Epgar score and all this kind of stuff. And then they wrap them up. They wrap them up tight like they're in the womb all over again. And many of them just stop crying because they're just, you know, what else are you going to do when you're in a straitjacket? <laughs> You'll find him wrapped in rags, essentially, laying in a feeding trough. The bread of life would be in a feeding trough. It's an amazing, humble arrive, arrival for Jesus Christ. And God sent these guys on this holy adventure. There's, there's a son that's been, that God has sent, and he's in Bethlehem. And they're the ones who know about it. Verse 13, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. So it says there were myriads, 10,000s of angels that showed up looking like the other one, who they were afraid of. And now there's 10,000s of them filling the sky and worshiping God. That might have been something to see. That's probably even better looking than uh, like the... the the northern lights, you know. I picture it that way. And God is showing his goodwill toward men by sending his son that he might bring peace on earth. Peace with God because of our sins, because of our brokenness. Christ came for that. Warning, subject to spontaneous outbursts of song and dance. I imagine that could have been pasted over any one of their heads. Warning. Warning. I might burst into song or dance at any moment. You got to be happy, right? And especially when the angels leave and you're not punished. You know, you didn't get struck by lightning or anything. Verse 15, so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. Yeah. Let's go. This is a, it's a show and tell moment, right? So let's go. Let's go, guys. And I imagine they didn't take their time. I imagine they ran to Bethlehem. I wonder if Jesus was thinking about this when he said the parable of the man who had 100 sheep and one of them went away. And he left the 99 in the wilderness just to go find the one. I wonder if Jesus was thinking of the shepherds that left their sheep there so they could go find the one. And verse 16, and they came with haste and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger, which is not anywhere you'd put a baby. Now, when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying, which was told to them concerning the child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things, which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and that were told to them. So here are a bunch of shepherds. You know, people are already looking at them askew. And now they're shouting, Yeshua's been born. 
which is Jesus' Hebrew pronunciation of his name, or Joshua, which is a lot of kids' names at that time. It's like saying, John's been born. Well, okay, that's nice to hear that. What, are you handing out cigars or what? And they're going up and down the streets in the middle of the night saying, Yeshua's been born. And they told everybody, and I'm sure they looked at him. They, yeah, we, we saw angels that came down into heaven, and they spoke to us, and they told us there was a, in Bethlehem. And, you know, I, I always get this English accent because, you know, I watch too many Jesus films. <laughs> they all have English accents. But they, they were so excited, and they told everybody. You know, they didn't have any pride in their heart whatsoever about not telling everyone. Quite honestly, that's what happens to us when we don't tell people about Jesus. It's pride. But perhaps that's why God chose them. Because they didn't have any. And they didn't care what anybody thought. We should be like shepherds. And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now, when they circumcised the child, there's a name change. If you remember, we're going through Genesis, and that happened with Abram. It was Abram. God came with the sign of the covenant and said, I want you to nip the tip. He said, okay. And he goes, from now on, you're going to be called Abraham instead of Abram. And so it's at the circumcision where Abraham gets a new name. And so it's a tradition. When they come on the eighth day, by the way, when vitamin K is at its peak in a child for clotting blood, how did God know? On the eighth day, eight is always the symbol of new beginnings because you have seven days and then the eighth day is the new beginning. I'm way, way deep over your head, sorry. They come and he was named Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. It's a, it's a scary thing. I saw my son get circumcised and uh, it wasn't with a knife quite like that Moyle is holding, but um, careful with that knife. In verse 22, now when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it is written in the law of the Lord that every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. So there's a sacrifice essentially for you to buy back your firstborn son. If you remember the Passover, the Passover took out the eldest son in every household unless you had blood applied to the lintel and the doorposts. And God said, from now on, all the firstborns, they're mine. I own them. Since, I, since they were saved through this blight that I brought, they're saved. And so you have to buy them back from me. And it's just a way of thanking God for opening the womb, for having children and being fertile and realizing this is God's and we're going to give him back to God, and so we're going to make a sacrifice. Well, there were a couple of different sacrifices that you could make. In Leviticus 12, 8, if she's not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtle doves, two young pigeons, one as a burnt offering and the other as a sin offering, so the priest shall make atonement for her and she shall be clean. There's this whole ceremony and procedure. You're supposed to be set aside for a certain amount of days and then you were able to go to the temple once everything was healed up and you were ready to go. There's a sacrifice to be made. This shows that they were poor. They couldn't bring a lamb, so they brought a couple of birds. Jesus not only was born under the most humble circumstances, but he grew up in a poor family. This is before the wise guys show up. Once the wise guys show up, they've got some gold, and it's good because they, they have to run away. But they're poor. A poor family with a husband who's not even married yet. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, which means hearing. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, another term for the Messiah. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And so he came by the Spirit into the temple. You've got this old man, old old man, comes to the temple and the Lord spoke to him and said, you will see the Messiah born in your lifetime before you die. That's an interesting 
thing for God to say. And so he's looking and hoping for the Messiah, the consolation of Israel, somebody who would ransom Israel, and many people thought ransom them from the Romans, not realizing he came to die for our sins so we might be right with him, which is a different thing. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to do to him according to the custom of the law with the sacrifice, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring salvation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. So imagine you've got this new baby, it's your first baby, so you're a little protective. You'll be protective. And suddenly an old man comes up with big wide eyes and takes your child. Hey, 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 old man, take it easy. It's a new baby, don't drop him, it's the Messiah. We'll be in deep trouble, okay? I don't know how you feel about giving your child to some very, very old man, but you're going to come up and presume to grab my kid? I don't know. Better step back. But he does. And he raises him up and he says, I've seen God's salvation. Salvation's a person. Jesus. He knew. This holy man knew who Jesus was. And he says, Now I can go home. I don't know if any of us are that old to say, oh, I'm so glad that he came, not only for Israel's sake, but now I can die. You know, looking forward to death is something that either insane people do or people do when they have a right relationship with God. And he says, I'm able to go, finally. And so, All of that happening in the temple, and of course, people are gathering around and wondering what's going on. And Joseph and his mother, Jesus' mother, Mary, marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. So he's giving her the bad news. This child is destined for the rising and falling of many, and it will be like a sword through your soul because Mary had to watch him hang on a cross. And here's the prophecy that this would occur. It wasn't a surprise. It wasn't a failure, it was a success of Jesus' ministry, except Mary needed to prepare herself and Simeon's doing the right thing by helping her. He was gonna be handed over to the Romans and there would be no one that stood with him. No, all of his disciples would scatter and he would be utterly and completely alone to defend himself, which he did not do because he was right and all of his actions proved he was right. All of his words proved he was right. They killed him anyway and he knew that. So Mary's being prepared for this so that on the day that it occurs, she would be ready. Now there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. And she was of great age. So you got a lot of old people hanging around the temple. And had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And, his, and this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple, but serve God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him and all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So it's not just this old man, Simeon, who sees Jesus and recognizes him. Anna, who gets married seven years from her virginity and then has been a widow for 84 years, 
She's old. This woman is old. And it says that she couldn't stop telling people about it. I've met people like that. They just tell you everything. Hey, did you hear about the child that was born, the redemption of Israel, the consolation, the Messiah's been born? I could see it happening in the temple. She's serving and praying in her old age. She doesn't sit back somewhere in a rocking chair and say, well, okay, Lord, take me. This woman's working. She's serving and praying and worshiping and witnessing. She's fasting and praying. Don't waste your old age, people. By the way, so this is Christmas. It's not about the toys. It's not about the tree. It's not about any of those things that we can get so distracted by. It's about Jesus coming. And there are those who say, well, he really wasn't born on the 25th of December. 25th of December was said by Constantine that we'll celebrate that because Saturnalia was there and the Yule log is actually a burning baby and you know I, you might know about all of the history of that but let me ask you a question if it wasn't the 25th of December would you pick a day and remember Jesus would you pick any day and celebrate Jesus or should you pick every day and celebrate Jesus I'm going to choose to celebrate Jesus every day so that Christmas is Christmas all year long, like the song says. Yeah. 